Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. The EBM Tools Network is co-coordinated by NatureServe and Octo. Um, and I have Andrew Lewin with me today who is uh, a new employee at Octo. Well, welcome Andrew. And he is um, uh, co-coordinating with me today. So uh, we're delighted to um, be able to present today uh, on tipping points, the resources and guidance for managing a changing ocean. And we are going to have a really great interactive panel discussion after the initial presentation. And um, our presenters today and panelists are Carrie Kappel from the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, NCES, Ashley Erickson from the Center for Ocean Solutions at Stanford University, Jamil Samori from the NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center, Martha Kongsgaard from the State of Washington Marine Resource Advisory Council, and Jack Kittinger from Conservation International. So we're really delighted all these guys could be with us uh, uh, here today. So before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions because uh, there's going to be a, a lot of time at the end for uh, question and discussion with a panel. So to, to send in questions, just type the questions into your question panel um, and then Ashley will be moderating questions to the pa panel. So um, but and you can send in questions whenever you want um, that will hold substantive questions uh, for discussion till the end. But if there's any quick clarifying questions, we may be able to address it during the presentation. Okay, well, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, um, Ashley and Carrie. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, this is Carrie right. Campbell, um, and I'm really pleased to be able to welcome everyone on behalf of the Ocean Tipping Points team. We're grateful to you all for taking time out of your day to come learn with us today. Uh, and we're going to try to keep things lively uh, in today's format. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually hand it over to Ashley and Sarah for a quick poll to see who's here with us today. Thanks, Carrie. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Ashley Erickson of the Center for Ocean Solutions. I'm one of the uh, team members on the Ocean Tipping Points project. And before we dig into the meat of the webinar, we wanted to take a few moments to get a sense of who's listening in. It looks like there's upwards of 150 of you on the line. And so we're really keen to know where you work, where you're coming from, and what sort of resource management context you're working in. And so Sarah is going to step us through a quick interactive poll using the WebEx system, starting with this first question, where do you work? So you're able to just press on one of those radio buttons and submit, and we'll see your results. All right, it looks like half of you have voted. Wow, you're voting really quickly. Well done, everyone. This is, <laughs> this is exciting. I feel like I'm an auctioneer or something. Uh, government is coming through to the top here with almost half of you coming from government, which is really fantastic. NGO and academia tied for second. And we got, a small... We got a comment, none of the above. I'm a student. But I think I'd probably do uh, academia. Academia, uh, yep. Yeah. Sarah. Great. Okay. So yeah. almost half from government and a quarter each from academia and NGO. Yeah. And now everybody can see the results from that. Super. Okay. And should we move on? Our, yeah. Let's move on. Okay. Okay. So where are you based in the world? And this, I got to say, was tough to select answer options. Mostly U.S. and Canada. We also acknowledge that we're dealing with a bit of a time zone difference here, so no, no big surprises there. Okay, I think that's probably what we're going to Great, yeah. Just about everyone, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And the last question here. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's the results from where everybody is. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. And then I will... Like that. Okay, which management context most closely describes your system? Acknowledging that there are many, we try to lump as many main issues together as possible. Okay, I'm seeing. 
a lot from the fisheries corner and also managing special places or protected areas. Getting close to almost everyone voting. Okay, and I and think uh, the results, I did share the results. The results. Great, okay, thanks so much for that, everyone. It's really helpful for us to know who's interested and engaged in this work, and especially to you for our panelists in the second half of the webinar to know who they're talking to um, in terms of what they're providing in, in detail and response. So, Carrie, let's uh, move on to slides because we did the next slide. We know who's here. Great. Okay. So, here's our rough plan. Carrie and I are going to talk to you through this PowerPoint for the next 20 minutes or so. I'm going to cover a bit of introduction, and Carrie's going to walk us through some of the main findings we have from our case study work and introduce you to our new web portal, which hopefully most of you saw the link to when we put out this webinar announcement. We'll take the second half of our time together in a panel discussion with several of our collaborators and partners on the project, Jamil, Martha, and Jack. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in greater detail when we kick off the panel. So that's the plan. Carrie, next slide. So before we go any further, we wanted to set out um, what we as a project have been defining when we reference the term tipping point and we talk about thresholds. Our working definition has been when incremental changes in human use or environmental conditions result in large and sometimes abrupt impacts to marine ecosystems. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this common example of the tipping point where the otter urchin kelp forest shift happened as a result of a crash in the sea otter population, which led to a boom in otter's common prey, the sea urchin, which then led to urchin barrens where we once had thriving kelp forests. So this example, among many others that we'll reference throughout the rest of the webinar, are what kind of drove this project to its um, early stages and thinking through how we can tackle these things. So speaking of, next slide, what is this project and what are our goals? So the first is to improve knowledge and understanding of ocean tipping points, their potential impacts, and their relevance to management. So we've been asking over the last several years, why are these tipping points happening? What are the consequences of crossing them? And can we get to a place where we can predict them before they even occur? Uh, the second major goal is to co-develop co and disseminate a toolbox of approaches for managers to use the knowledge of ecosystem thresholds when implementing ecosystem-based management. So in other words, we're not taking on this very heavy scientific research project without coming to a place where we're able to package and deliver this knowledge in a way that's useful for our target management audiences. And so we'll talk more about that when Carrie introduces the web portal. So who are we? Next slide, Carrie. Sorry, um, my PowerPoint just okay. crashed. Pull it back up. <laughs> so I'll keep I'll keep going. We'll pull it back up. So this slide is a quick uh, set of statistics, essentially who we are as a project by the numbers. Uh, we are a five-year project, and we're actually in our fifth and final year, and indeed our final month, with primary funding from the Moore Foundation. We have APIs on the project from five institutions, and over the years we've had a total of 54 research team members work on the project. We work primarily in two case study regions of Haida Gwaii and Hawaii, which Carrie is going to describe in more detail here in a moment. And through those case studies, we've joined forces with seven additional partner institutions. In total, the project team over the last five years has developed and put out 16 peer-reviewed articles and given over 75 presentations to partners, managers, and academic audiences. Um, and, and finally, these two groups at the end here have been so integral to the project the, um, to keep our work grounded in management reality. Early on, we convened a 10-member expert management advisory group. We've done that several times in person and over webinar and phone calls over the years. And indeed, one of our management advisory group members, Mark Kong, is here today to serve on our panel. We've also hosted an eight-member scientific working group in the early years of the project to tackle some of those key foundational research questions early on. So in short, the project has been a complex web of interaction across and between 
a variety of partners, researchers, and target audiences. And we've learned a lot through this interdisciplinary collaboration about good communication and the importance of co-development of, of ideas. So these last two slides I'll talk through are, Gary, next slide. Um, some of the foundational pieces we did early on in the project um, where we basically led us, the, the results led us to the conclusion that tipping points are indeed common around the world. And thus, given the, the extreme consequences of them, worth deep study and understanding. So we first found that a wide range of marine habitats across the globe have experienced ecosystem shifts from the intertidal to the open ocean. This image here depicts nearly 100 examples across geographies and habitats that we've compiled into a global database. And as you can see, we found the largest number of shifts recorded in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, which I guess shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us, given there are many of the largest and most well-studied regions globally. And in addition, next slide, Carrie. Also early on in the project, we found that half of the studied relationships between drivers and ecosystem components in the open ocean are nonlinear. We pulled together as many published studies as we could find from ocean open, open ocean systems and where the authors had looked at a relationship between one or more ecological components of the system and some driver or stressor, like a climate variable, fishing pressure, changes in the food web, or pollution levels. And then the authors of this study fit the relationship to the data in the paper to see whether it was linear or nonlinear. And here you can see in the dark green up top are the nonlinear relationships that we found. And, and the second half, right, the gray are the linear, um, representing the nonlinear relationship. So given this foundation, I'm going to pass it off to Carrie, who can give us a deeper look into our case study work and also introduce you to our our new web portal that we've compiled of all of our findings and resources. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, uh, so building on the earlier synthesis phase of the project, which Ashley just discussed, we also engaged deeply in two specific case studies, one for nearshore reefs in Hawaii and the other for um, the nearshore pelagic ecosystem that is centered on Pacific herring up in British Columbia in Haida Gwaii. Both presented really interesting um, past or potential tipping points with open scientific questions, a set of willing partners, and a window of opportunity to inform ecosystem-based management decision making. So I'll start with Hawaii. Um, coral reefs have been a poster child for tipping points for many years based on the dramatic and difficult to reverse changes that were observed on many Caribbean reefs and other reefs around the world, which have gone from being dominated by living corals to being dominated by fleshy seaweeds. In Hawaii, rising stressors were leading to concerns in the um, local community that their reefs might be headed for a tipping point too. So, um, our case study goals were to try to inform reef management in the main Hawaiian islands by characterizing ecosystem regimes and trying to relate them to key environmental and human drivers to disentangle the effects of those different factors, to identify indicators of reef state and health and quantify thresholds for specific drivers that could be useful for management. Uh, and finally, to evaluate trade-offs associated with different management alternatives that are aimed at promoting reef resilience. To answer these questions, our Hawaii case study team first compiled an unprecedented database of over 3,000 underwater surveys of both fish and benthic communities drawn from multiple different sampling programs. Mary Donovan from UH led the Herculean effort to calibrate those data sets across all the different methods so they could be used in a single analysis. She then used um, multivariate model-based cluster analysis to find that the diversity of Hawaiian reefs doesn't actually fall into those sim two simple categories of healthy or degraded, but rather when you look at both the fish and the benthic functional groups together, which you see represented here by those different color wedges in the petal plot in the upper right corner, you actually find five different um, reef regimes or reef types. There's a low coral, low complexity degraded reef with very few fish, number one here on the left, um, and that's typical of places like Waikiki. There are also three relatively healthy coral dominated reef types, but they vary in their fish communities in, in important ways. 
those are numbers three, four, and five. Um, and one of these, interestingly, number four was very variable, um, it, and this may actually represent a transitional state between some of the other reef types. Finally, there's another type that I skipped over, number two, that's characteristic of Hawaii's rocky north shores. Um, we call this the complex boulder reef. It's got a lot of habitat complexity, lots of fish biomass, um, but a lot, much of that complexity comes from boulders rather than, um, than corals. So our collaborator, um, Jean-Baptiste Jouffre from the Stockholm Resilience Center led a complementary boosted regression tree analysis to um, assess the factors that correlate with these five different reef types. And, that, and that's helped us to distinguish the effects of environment from human activity. And the drivers that are linked with each of these regimes are listed here in the blue, those are the environmental or physical drivers, and um, in orange, the human drivers. Just as an example, that degraded reef uh, site tends to be associated with places that are heavily used for, for fishing and that have pretty high levels of land-based pollution. Um, the complex boulder reef, in contrast, has low fishing levels, in part because it's a pretty hard place to access, really high wave environment. Um, and the environmental factors of that boulder habitat and the high wave energy tend to um, characterize this regime and, and uh, pull it out from the other types. So understanding what drives the different regimes can help prioritize appropriate management actions to improve reef resilience. Many of the regimes are driven at least in part by environmental factors, but fishing is a strong predictor of um, two of the five, the, both the degraded reef regime and one of the coral regimes. Um, and some recent analysis that uh, Jean-Baptiste has been working on suggests that land-based pollution is also important for some regions and at some spatial scales. And we're still working on some of this finer scale analysis. A complementary analysis led by our collaborator Kirsten Olison at University of Hawaii and other members of our case study team looked at different options to reduce one of those major land-based drivers for the reefs of Hawaii, of, of Maui, sorry. And, um, in that paper, we found that cooperation across landowners is really key for tackling, uh, in this case, sedimentation and other land-based sources of pollution in a cost-effective manner. And that paper's in the Journal of Environmental Management uh, and on our website if you're interested. The impact of this Hawaii work has been, um, has been strong. We are, we've been working since the beginning pretty closely with the state to try to translate our results into action. And um, recently, the governor of Hawaii established uh, his 30 by 30 initiative, which, which aims to have 30% of Hawaii's nearshore waters under effective management by 2030. And so the results of the project are coming out just in time to help inform what might be the most important areas for protection and the top drivers to address in, um, in ensuring effective management of those areas under this initiative. So we've been working closely on, on them, uh, with them to translate our results for that specific management action, application. And the other thing that I think has been valuable is just that there are a lot of different um, projects that have spun off from this that are enabled by the big data synthesis effort that was required to do the analyses that I just mentioned. And the, um, many of the data sets, all of the human and environmental driver data are on the PACIOS website. And I list the, um, the URL here if you're interested. It's also linked from our website. Okay, so now I'll share a few highlights from our Haida Gwaii case study. This is work led by Phil Levin and conducted by a great team of collaborators. Uh, just to orient you in case you don't know where Haida Gwaii is, this is an archipelago that is off the west coast of Canada. Um, it's pretty far north, almost all the way to Alaska. Haida Gwaii means islands of the people. And this is an archipelago that's been inhabited by the Haida First Nation for um, something like 13,000 years. The lower third of the archipelago is protected from the tops of the mountains out into the water through three layers of protection. It's the Guayhanas National Park Reserve, it's a National Marine Conservation Area Reserve, and it's a Haida Heritage Site. And this um, land-sea area is cooperatively managed by the Archipelago Management Board, which is made up of rep representatives from both the Council of the Haida Nation and the Government of Canada. 
as I said earlier, our focus for the case study in Haida Gwaii was on Pacific herring and their linkages in the ecosystem because they are so central to Haida Gwaii's ecology, its economy, and its culture. But herring have experienced at least two major population declines in recent decades. One in the 1960s, that left-hand arrow, um, following massive fishing effort, and then another in the early 1990s. And recovery from that latest crash has been slow, especially in Haida Gwaii. So we were interested in why that's the case, um, what caused the crash, and what limits recovery now, uh, how that's affected the system, including people, and what management alternatives might be available to improve the sustainability of this resource and the ecosystem it helps support and to avoid future undesirable collapse or tipping points. Sorry, I went backwards. Um, let's see. So, um, Using a hierarchical Bayesian state space model, our project collaborator, collaborator Adrian Steyer, um, showed first that fishing and climate fluctuations are likely to blame for past collapses. Uh, Adrian also showed that not only has herring abundance changed in time, but it's also changed in space in important ways. So to understand this, you need to know that that scientists are coming to understand that herring actually exhibit a homing behavior in coming back to the particular inlets to spawn, much like salmon do. And in this case, young, we think the mechanism is that young fish follow older fish to the spawning grounds. It's also important to realize that there's, it's common for there to be a lot of variation in spawning abundance among those inlets in any one year, as you can see from this graph, which shows six inlet level time series of um, spawning abundance versus the overall archipelago scale pattern. And you see there, these different time series are not necessarily in sync year to year. What we've seen and what Adrian showed is in Haida Gwaii is that over time, some of the inlets that once were the most productive have been the slowest to recover. And recovery um, has been faster in some of the more remote parts of the archipelago. And that may be due to the way commercial fishing operates, which is to target the um, closest and largest spawning aggregation on any given year and fish it hard. And this has reduced the number of older fish in the population who are able to lead the younger fish back to those spawning locations. Over time, that variability we used to see among the inlets has been eroded, as you see on this, this graph. Um, and with that, a lot of the resilience in the system those different inlets used to function like a portfolio, buffering against uncertain year-to-year -year conditions. Um, but now that portfolio effect has been eroded and the inlets are more in sync. So a bad year in one place tends to be a bad year all around Haida Gwaii. So those ecological results and conversations with partners and locals begged the question of how the spatial and temporal changes in herring abundance have affected local people and culture and whether there have been sociocultural tipping points that maybe have been crossed as a result. Clearly, the spatial changes have affected um, where and when people can harvest the um, herring eggs, which is called gao in the um, Haida language. And um, it's also affected how, what method they use to harvest the eggs and by whom. Now, typically, you have to have a boat. Um, it's a longer drive to get to the places where they're spawning reliably, more expensive, um, tends to be done with, by men rather than women who used to be able to go out into the intertidal and harvest by hand. So um, this led us, uh, these sorts of questions and observations led us to design a participatory research project with managers and local partners to answer these questions through ethnographic fieldwork. And this is work led by our, our partner, Melissa Poe from Washington Sea Grant. And so far, what Melissa and the team have learned um, from incorporating social and cultural values with herring spatial ecology is that those spatial changes are likely affecting important cultural values, including traditional food practices, connection to the marine environment, and opportunities for sharing knowledge and teaching. Okay, the last vignette from our Haida Gwaii work. Um, early on, we heard from our partners that they wanted our help looking at the relative effects of the commercial fishery and the traditional harvest of spawn on kelp or the herring eggs on long-term sustainability of herring. And Council of the Haida Nation partners 
had been saying for years that harvesting the adults has a more negative impact than harvesting gal or the eggs. Um, biologically, this is pretty straightforward. If you harvest the adults before they've had a chance to spawn, that's more likely to affect the population than harvesting the eggs after the adults have spawned. But what made this example interesting, I think, is the exchange that took place between our research team and the management partners and um, local traditional ecological knowledge holders. So led by Oli Shelton of NOAA Fisheries, we were able to demonstrate something the Haida had been saying for years based on traditional ecological knowledge, but put it in the terms of the DFO stock assessment model. So the biological straightforward question led us to some novel ways of thinking about the system and thinking about trade-offs and allocation between these two forms of harvest. So the first innovation was to come up with a socially relevant metric of sustainability, which was the risk of fisheries closures. Um, and that's, it, that was important because that risk is borne really differently by local small-scale harvesters versus the big commercial fleet, which has more mobility and ability to switch targets. Second, um, this uh, combined analysis, the trade-off analysis, allows you to consider both cultural and commercial values uh, in a single analysis, and that was new. And finally, um, we added an ecosystem consideration by incorporating a known tipping point in the biomass of forage fish, the herring in this case, that's needed to support breeding bird success. And together, the model results along these three dimensions help to describe a safe, what we call a safe operating space for sustainable fishing for the system, where undesirable social and ecological tipping points can be avoided. If you want to learn more about this, the paper um, is out in scientific reports, and there's also a really interesting blog post by Alejandro Fried uh, about how this model could potentially be useful to indigenous people in the region. Okay, so that was a very whirlwind brief taste of the results of the project. There's lots more that we didn't have time to talk about today, um, but you can find a lot of it on our recently launched web portal. So in this site, we've attempted to distill the lessons learned, the tools and approaches from across the project's many components and make them accessible in particular to the, to the coastal and marine resource um, and, and uh, management community. So I encourage you to check out the website. Um, it includes general information about these concepts and their application to management, as well as more specific information on methods and analyses. The website generally goes from more general introductory on the left to more specific and meaty as you move across the menus to the right. There's some background information under understanding tipping points. Then the next tab, improving ocean management, um, tries to present the, the information through four different lenses, um, four different management contexts, ecosystem-based management, fisheries, restoration and recovery, and water quality management. And I'm glad to see that we had some representatives across all of those contexts on the call today. You, if you go to that section of the website, you can dig in more to specific examples. Uh, the Aligning with Law and Policy tab shares results of our legal analyses and our work to try to highlight the insertion points where tipping point science could be integrated into environmental impact assessment under the National Environmental Policy Act um, or the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. Uh, under into fisheries management under Magnuson Stevens, protected species management under the Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act, and water quality management under the Clean Water Act. I acknowledge this. We had we definitely had a U.S. and North American bias in our legal analysis, just based on the expertise on our team. Um, but I think there are uh, analogs to other environmental laws around the world. Okay, uh, if you were. If your appetite was wet for more information on the case studies, this is where you'll find it. The Exploring Case Studies tab has a bunch more about both our Hawaii and Haida Gwaii case studies, including links to the papers. And in the final tab, um, you can access a comprehensive guide that we put together that walks you through the conceptual framework for applying a tipping points approach to any adaptive management process. And it's illustrated with lots of examples and links to papers and other resources. There's a downloadable PDF version of it available there. Finally, I'll just highlight the link to our community of practice portal. This will actually take you out of 
our website and over to Open Channels, where we have a forum for the dynamic exchange of ideas among scientists and managers interested in tipping point science. And we're just really getting this started, so we would love to invite you to come over there, sign up, add information, share. Um, it's really a place to connect with others in the community, share your knowledge, um, access relevant resources and opportunities, uh, and we hope you find it useful and that you'll help us co-create it and make it into a tool that's useful for the community. As part of our effort to build this community of practice around the approach, we're hosting a training workshop in a couple of weeks. I know some of our um, applicants for that workshop, I think, are on the line today. Um, and that the aim of that is to bring teams of scientists and managers together to dig deeper into these methods and learn more about applying them in their own systems. And we're really excited about that. And we hope to be able to do more of those trainings in the future. So, so stay tuned on that front. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Ashley to moderate our panel discussion. Ashley, are you there? Ashley, are you muted yes. by any chance, Ashley? I'm here, yes. I was frantically trying to unmute. Apologies. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, at this point, we're going to shift gears a bit away from PowerPoint and into next slide, Carrie. Uh, our, our panel discussion with some of our experts from the project team and apologies that uh, we couldn't hook up the video link so you could actually see some of our panelists but here are their smiling faces in static form. Um, so as Sarah mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we have Carrie, who you've just heard from, from uh, NCs on our panel. She's the main project PI for the Ocean Tipping Points Project. We have Martha Kongsgaard, who is uh, actually chair of the State of Washington's Marine Resource Advisory Council and also one of our expert management advisory group members. Jamil Samori, um, the Ecosystem Science Program Manager from the NOAA Fish NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and finally Jack Kinder uh, from Conservation International. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a little more detail, and then I'll lead out with a moderator question. But then I hope that at that point, you all will have plenty of questions of your own. And I'll remind you again of the, the question bar option where you can type in your own your own questions and I'll do my best to read and collate them on the fly so we can get as many answered as possible in our remaining time together. So uh, let's start with Carrie. I think you're a good lead off for us. Um, not giving you a very big break between your last presentation and this, but um, have you introduced yourself a little bit and your own work and research and thinking around to do point concepts and also remind us of uh, what your role in the Ocean Tipping Point project has been, and then we'll we'll go from there. Okay, great. Thanks, Ashley. Um, it's been my pleasure to work on the this project over the last five years. I've um, my co-PIs and I uh, put together a really an awesome team, and it's such a privilege to work with them and learn from them over this period of time. As the lead PI, uh, a lot of my role has been to be the head cat herder for this big distributed team, uh, but I've also been able to dive into the research during both the synthesis phase and in both of the case studies. Um, and in that, my role has been to bring um, tools from, from my toolbox, from synthesis science, from interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, spatial ecology, and community ecology into the mix. Um, yeah. Hopefully that's enough for me. Great. Thanks, Carrie. And were we able to get Martha on the line? Martha's on the line. Oh, great. Um, there you are, Martha. Let's move on to you. Yeah, greetings, everyone. My name is Martha. I live in Seattle, and I, um, I'm not a scientist. I'm a lay person. I'm a, a, a lawyer, a non-practicing lawyer. In fact, appointed by the governor um, to chair two legislatively created bodies that work um, mostly in the marine environment, board chair of the Puget Sound Partnership, which is a state agency that was formed a decade or so ago with overseeing the restoration of Puget Sound. And maybe more uh, saliently for this conversation is chair of the Marine Resource Advisory Council, which is charged some years ago with implementing the findings of a groundbreaking 2012 Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Acidification. Uh, which was a body that was created 
after a really catastrophic oyster die-off in Oregon and Washington. So I came to this really maybe being uh, still stuck slightly in the sort of old world view that uh, ecosystems are predictable um, species, you know, sort of lived in a place and a time and there would be a predictable succession as time moved on, this sort of uh, classic way of looking at the ecosystem and certainly learned uh, or, or relearned uh, uh, deeply through this project that I was wrong, that many of the plans that we're using in, in resource management um, are not taking advantage of, of this uh, sort of more modern thinking around uh, thresholds. And, you know, this switch from parts view of the ecosystem toward this view where ecosystems are unpredictable and dynamic and complex, especially in light of climate change and this sort of unknown future, is really where we need to be spending our dollars and our science. So this was really a wonderful revelation for me. And I've been able, uh, to a certain extent, to bring this back to the work we're trying to do here in the state of Washington. So thanks for having me. Look forward to the conversation. Great. Thanks, Martha. Jamil, let's head over to you next. Hi, everyone. I am Jamil Samhori, and I was also a, like Carrie, a co-PI with the Ocean Tipping Points Project. I got involved because it seemed like a really exceptional opportunity to bring together people with a variety of backgrounds, scientists, but also lawyers and people that were on the ground doing the hard work of ocean management to tackle an interesting and challenging problem of, you know, where are tipping points occurring and can we predict them? What do we do if they've occurred to get back to a place that keeps people happy with the place that they live in? I spent most of my energy um, focused on the Haida Gwaii case study, uh, serving as um, an, in an advisory role on several of the papers that came out of that and working with our partners on the ground in Haida Gwaii. Um, as you heard from Carrie, there we were trying to understand what collapses and recoveries of Pacific Herring mean for the food web and the social systems, uh, especially as they relate to Haida cultural practices. Um, I got my start down this road at a time when ecosystem-based management um, had just sort of was on the rise with the consensus statement, a U.S. national ocean policy being put into place. Um, and it all sort of seemed like the wave of the future, but there weren't many methods available for oper operationalizing it. And so we started developing indicators as a way of answering the first question of how is the ecosystem doing? And it became immediately clear that we couldn't answer that question adequately until we could answer enough, another question, which is how are we doing relative to what? And, and my feeling is that relative to tipping points and thresholds that distinguish desirable ecosystem conditions from those that are undesirable from a societal perspective, is um, as good a scientific and legal answer as we can provide. So a lot of my work since then has focused on that and ocean tipping points has been central to that. So I, I think I'll stop there for now and I look forward to talking more. Thanks, Jamil. Jack? Hi everybody, I'm Jack Kittinger. I work for Conservation International. Uh, prior to that, I worked with Ashley and the folks at the Center for Ocean Solutions at Stanford University. and. Uh, was part of the initial team uh, that developed the Ocean Tipping Points project, and in particular, the Hawaii case study. Uh, I live and work in Hawaii, and um, since my transition from uh, the Center for Ocean Solutions to Conservation International, have been involved more in the practical applications of taking the complex and wonderful science that the team is doing and embedding it in existing policy initiatives. And uh, that's absolutely been a co-learning process. Um, it's been very important to uh, the state's initiative that uh, Carrie mentioned to effectively manage 30% of our reefs by 2030. That was announced at the World Conservation Congress last um, uh, Congress, which was held here in Hawaii. And it's been kind of a north star for the state. And of course, we have to figure out how to get there. And understanding these thresholds and, and the kinds of tipping points in, that can occur in the different regimes in reefs has been very instrumental because it just we just can't go to managers and say, look, it's complicated. We've got to get some principles and some basic, um, uh, you know, safe operating space type thinking 
into the management practice so we can feasibly understand what kinds of interventions will lead to outcomes that we want, as Jamil said. Great. Thanks, Jack. So I think I'll lead off with a question that actually it looks like at least one of you already had, and I'll tie in another question that another of you posted with it. Um, so Carrie's detailed and with backup from Jamil and Jack and Martha, some of the things that we've accomplished over the years on this project. And in addition, it's not just this huge collaboration, the Ocean Tipping Points project that's working on these things. There's this, a whole constellation of researchers and um, practitioners out there that are thinking about this work. It is still nonetheless I think on the in the new frontier category of thinking, as Martha mentioned, we're all sort of transitioning how we think about these big shifts that are happening around us in the ocean. So what's next? How can we build from this foundation laid by all of these bright minds around the world? And what's kind of the new frontier for this work moving forward? And what's what are some next steps, I think, for the project and its collaboration, but also more broadly in your own work and from your own corners of the world? And in particular, what about climate change? And how is climate change woven into all of this thinking moving forward? And whoever wants to jump in first, so I'll let you go. Uh, this as someone who uh, works at with certification, it was um, you know climate sits at the at the very uh, center of that. And when this die-off happened, and the oystermen were wondering, was it Vibrio virus? What was the um, the state mobilized a roundtable of all the stakeholders from the academy to the EPA to NOAA to state agencies, NGOs, and the legislature. To try to set out to understand, you know, what was going on in the ecosystem, um, and what was the desire of this sort of community, um, you know, to invest or not invest in the science it was going to take to save the shellfish industry in our state. So it was very, very uh, helpful. It was very um, in our face. It was not sort of theoretical. Um, and we set out to try to understand what the threshold was and what the science was telling us about. You know, beyond which the carbonate chemistry would allow for shell formation. And we did that so that we could understand, you know, how far back from the cliff do we have to get? What is it going to cost? And was the community willing to go there? That was a, that's a different way of attacking uh, an issue than we had done in the past. Certainly in Puget Sound Recovery, it was a, a big sort of meta plan that certainly had targets and indicators. But as I think Jack said, you know, it was hard to know how we were, you know, where are we going relative to what. It was really clear. You can either form a shell or you can't form a shell. Um, so it really helped us to understand how much resilience we had to uh, sort of. And our science community uh, rallied around the industry and figured out how to buffer hatcheries, how to low pH events. Um, you know, when you talk about, so we could do it in embayments, we could do it at hatcheries. I think the bigger question is um, this huge stressor, carbon dioxide, outside the hatchery. What are we going to do about Dungeness crab and pteropods? Um, they're at the base of the, of the food chain. I, I, I'll be really interested to see how we can sort of move forward when we understand there probably is a tipping point out there, but not really understanding how we can stop it without, you know, turning off uh, that carbon pollution signal. Maybe I can jump in following on that. You know, whereas the major threat in that geography is acidification, um, the major threat for reefs, of course, is, is bleaching, which is primarily a thermal stress. And, and of course, the acidification poses threats to reef environments too. But it's interesting to know that Hawaii dodged most of the major bleaching events in the Indo-Pacific that happened uh, in the last just couple decades, really. And um, But it didn't dodge the last major one, which has you know, been occurring over the last three years, 
And so it was a bit of a wake-up call. This project happened and it's been in progress since that uh, bleaching stress has hit our reef systems. And it really has woken up, um, you know, the collective community here and, and elsewhere to the threat that, that poses locally. And with climate change, the issue with reefs, of course, is what you can control versus what you can't control. And the analyses in the Tipping Points project has allowed us to quantify some of our local stressors, like overfishing and land-based pollution and things, um, so that we can try to dial those back in order to deal with the larger uh, issue of climate change, which is an existential threat to reefs. And, and reefs are the backbone of our ocean-based economy here. We get 8 million visitors a year. They come to see uh, the, the beautiful reefs and, of course, our beautiful landscapes. And once those are gone, um, that economic uh, driver may diminish as well, and that's going to have a major impact on communities. So um, this has been a big focus for the state, and the, the development of this kind of threshold-based approach has resonated due to the threat of climate change and the impacts it's had over the past several years. That's great, Jeff. Jerry or Jamil? Yeah, I'll just add uh, one note to that on the Hawaii side. I mean, as Jack said, that the bleaching was a um, a recent event for Hawaii, and and so it actually wasn't um, captured in the data sets that we used for the analysis. So it, it really um, those analyses can help us to understand the local drivers. And a clear next scientific step is to integrate the work we've done so far about those local drivers with forecasts of bleaching probabilities for Hawaii moving forward. And, and there's some stuff spinning up in the works already, I think, to try to um, bring those two things together to understand how much resilience you can build by um, dialing back the local stressors in the face of um, more and more frequent thermal events. The other um, emerging topic that's on everybody's minds right now, and I think um, is going to sort of blooming naturally out of the um, pieces of this project is the uh, work that's happening and starting to spin up in North America around um, climate events and um, fisheries impacts. So both of the East Coast and the West Coast of North America have experienced um, just kind of beyond normal, uh, extra normal um, climate events like the warm blob that sat off of the west coast for for so long um, and had you know really detrimental effects on fisheries and th those give us a kind of window into what the future might look like um, and we, I, people on our team and others uh, around the country are starting to um, really try to link up what's known about current thresholds for sort of both physiological tolerances and ecosystem thresholds um, with forecasting models to better understand what those extreme events might mean, um, both for the, e the ecology of the system, but also for the dependent um, fishing communities and um, coastal, coastal communities and their economies and, and cultures, um, especially for First Nations along the West Coast. I don't know, Jamil, if you want to say any more about that, you've been really involved in um, some of that emerging work. Yeah, sure. That's a great place for me to um, pick up. I was thinking that, you know, one of the things that Carrie and I are really excited about right now is extending our understanding of these herring collapses and recoveries in Haida Gwaii to think about what that means in, in the context of the social consequences. And so, um, I think, you know, while we're focused on Haida Gwaii right now, the, the approach is one that is quite general, which is to try to quantify how an ecosystem is changing in response to different stressors, and then use that to develop scenarios of possible futures given interventions or not, similar to what the IPCC does with a business as usual versus, you know, more um, dramatic interventions to reduce carbon emissions. And so, then what you can do is you can go and say, given these possible futures, what do people want? What distinguishes an acceptable set of environmental conditions from a set that's not acceptable? And how does that depend on demographics, the cultural t context, um, and all sorts of things? And it's our hope that with that kind of information in hand, 
decision makers will be better equipped to um, move forward into the future with their eyes wide open to what people want and how to navigate there. Thanks, Danielle. Following on that, we've we've had a couple of questions that are a little interrelated with what you've just said about social preferences and understanding, you know, eyes wide open moving forward. So a couple of folks have asked if folks can reflect on our experiences working with and learning from local communities in doing some of this research. And so I know we've got some rich examples from both Haida Gwaii and Hawaii on that. And, and related, how we've engaged specifically the management community and other stakeholders in those jurisdictions around um, some of our results and how those things might be applied in management policy moving forward. So um, linked and related uh, questions that I think any of you could tackle first, but maybe uh, Jamil or Carrie from the Haida Gwaii case study could be a good place to start. Sure. Um, in both case studies, uh, what was essential to our approach, I think, was actually starting with the partners from the very beginning. And we didn't decide on a case study until we made these phone calls and got somebody on the other end of the line um, who was a local decision maker who would say, who could say, yes, we, we want to work with you. Yes, we're excited about this. We think it has potential. And they were in it with us from the beginning. Um, and so that the questions and the, to some extent, the research approach and um, the potential for uptake, that was all uh, co-created with those partners through um, mostly just lots of conversation, endless phone calls and <laughs> meetings and um, sharing of our scientific results before we were maybe done with them or ready, which can be uncomfortable for scientists sometimes, but which was so valuable in keeping us um, on the right path towards something that could be useful. Um, and I think in Haida Gwaii in particular, that was just such a rich exchange to be in that two-way dialogue from the beginning because we ended up um, asking questions that were um, different from the ones maybe we, we had in our heads when we started out. Uh, those led us to new insights and new techniques that kind of alluded to that on the trade-off analysis. Um, and, and, and even new theory came out of that exchange with the, the managers. So I think there were, you know, we kind of went into it thinking like, oh, we, we're doing this engagement because it's all about uptake. And yes, that it was valuable for uptake to be working with the partners from the beginning. But there were also these feedbacks where um, really trying to meet each other where we were um, all brought us to new questions and new scientific insights too. Somebody else want to jump Karen. in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jamil, anything to add there or Jack from Hawaii's perspective? I 100% agree with what Carrie said and would just emphasize the importance of taking the time to develop the relationships and the trust with the communities we were working with. I think has been something that's been really positive and growth side for me and my job, but also I think will lead to um, a greater uptake of the work that we've done. Thanks, so I'm looking the, mindful of time. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Well, I was just going to say real quickly that, I, you know, this isn't specific to tipping points, right? This is half of you are managers. And so, um, you know, this is something that, that is relevant to any kind of enterprise where scientific initiatives are meant to inform management. Building the uptake pathway from the outset is, is all about relationships. You know, that's the fundamental unit through which these things go from the, the, the analytical side into the uptake items and that's going to keep both geographies absolutely key. Thanks, Jack. And that was a that was actually a pretty good last word. I'm mindful of time that we're already at ten fifty nine. We had a couple of other questions. One about 
restoration and recovery and another about early warning indicators and how developed the science is there, among others. So I think we, um, we actually know who's asked some of these questions, so we'll be able to follow up with you all separately um, rather than take any more of your time beyond what's already in your calendar. Any last final words from the panel before we sign off? And otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. Yeah, I just echo that. Thank you, and and encourage folks to also go. You know, check out the portal. Um, you can find answers to some of those questions at least there. And we do look forward to following up with you after the after the panel. Great, thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you panelists for your thoughts. And it's 11 a.m. at least on the Pacific Coast. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank Anything you. else we need to do, Sarah? Nope, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and I just say thanks to everyone as well. This is a great presentation and great discussion. Okay, I'll be in touch. Thank you. All. Great. Thanks so much. Bye bye.